Hi there. Welcome to the DCL Learning Series. Today's webinar is titled Map or Scrap? Consol Consolidating Data Between Inherited Enterprise Systems. My name is Marianne Kalahana, and I'm the VP of Marketing here at Data Conversion Laboratory, and I'll be your moderator today. A couple quick things before we begin. The webinar is being recorded, and it will be available in the on-demand section of our website at dataconversionlaboratory.com. Um, we invite you to submit questions or comments at any point during today's conversation. We'll save some time at the end to be sure we can address all of those. So I think everyone here really understands um, that technology plays a critical role in the life sciences accuracy, traceability, compliance, along with speed to market is, is critical. By improving content and data management, IT systems and program management, you can streamline scientific research and drug development. Data Conversion Laboratory, Court Square Group, and JANA Life Sciences developed this learning series to address how technology can, can contribute to your success. This is the final webinar in our series. And in the handout section um, in GoToWebinar, you'll see a document titled DCL Life Sciences Resources. This has um, links to all the other webinars in the series that you see listed here. And we invite you to revisit and watch those on demand. And um, please feel free to share those with your colleagues. Before I turn it over to our speakers, I'd like to give a quick intro to Data Conversion Laboratory, or DCL, as we are also known. Our mission is to structure the world's content. Our services and solutions are all about converting, um, structuring, and enriching content and data. We are one of the leading providers of XML conversion services and an industry expert in SPL conversion for global pharma companies. If you have complex data or content challenges, give us a call. We are truly happy to help. Today's speakers, I'm happy to introduce um, Mark Gross, President at Data Conversion Laboratory, Keith Parent, CEO at Court Square Group, and Ron Nyland, President at Jana Life Sciences. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Keith, could you tell us a little bit about CourtSquare Group? Sure. CourtSquare is a managed service firm. We manage infrastructure for life science companies in our audit-ready compliant cloud environment, specifically designed to host um, qualified and validated applications. And we have a specific um, application called RegDoc 365, which is a qualified and validated content management system specifically for um, clinical and regulatory data. We use that as a platform for hosting lots of different data across the board, all the way from the beginning and the startup of a company, all the way through to them submitting to the FDA and tying into manufacturing. Next. As for Jana Life Sciences, we're a third generation family owned company founded in 1973. Uh, we are certified to ISO 9001 2015, and we're just, we just completed our second audit associated with the new standard ISO 13485 for medical devices. We're basically a technical services company that focus on technical documentation. Like some of, uh, like our partner here, DCL, we also work in the areas of XML and DITA. Uh, we provide not only technical writing, but also engineering services. We're a projectized company with project managers at the heart of each and every project we do. And really beyond content development, I would say the other area that we focus in, in on is related to operational excellence, just ensuring that processes and systems come together and uh, enable a company to be not only efficient, but compliant. Great, now as we get into our webinar for today, I think that this is something that I just wanna to talk to everybody about. If you've seen the other um, parts of our series, you've seen us going into a lot of detail 
around metadata, around the data itself, the content across the board. This particular one called Mapper Scrap talks specifically about enterprise systems and what happens with um, all of those old systems that you need to now configure into new systems and tie things together. So we wanted to have one, some, one webinar that basically talked about some of the issues you're going to deal with. And we're going to make this a very practical one. There's going to be a lot of conversations. You can look at Mark and Ron and I, and you can see that we're no spring chickens, and we've been around for a while. So we've seen a lot of these uh, different types of systems come and go. And uh, we want, to, want you guys to learn a little bit from our experience of having to deal with those. So this first slide, we're talking about technology road mapping and the fact that in whether it's pharmaceutical or med device or biologics, we're talking specifically around um, you always, there's always this transition and this continuum of systems where you go from transitioning from early research, you then have to get into clinical systems and regulatory, you're dealing with the regulatory authorities. And then if you're lucky enough to have something that gets approved, you now have to go into manufacturing and post-launch and, and all the things that happen along that spectrum. Um, you know, looking at your product along the way, and in that spectrum, you've got all these different systems, and those systems have to talk together. Um, our goal is to make sure that when we are dealing with these, this continuum, that it's as easy as possible to talk and, and transfer data. There's nothing worse than, than uh, data that gets lost, or you have to clean that data. We, we, we far too often have to deal with a lot of these projects where we're actually cleaning data, and it seems like that's a tremendous waste of money and time and effort in, in this industry, and it happens far too often. Uh, Mark or Ron, you guys want to comment on that? Mark, you're on uh, mute. Yeah, and no, I don't think I have any further comment on this over here. Right? Maybe Ron does. Yeah, I, you know, I guess my general sense is when it comes to data, it's sort of living and breathing information right and uh you know with with that said uh there is a life cycle associated with it and so data is sort of coming and going it's sort of living it's breathing it's you know ultimately it may be dying um if you will when it gets archived put into its final resting place but uh you know if we think about the aspect of uh the broader industries biotech and pharmaceuticals and medtech uh, there's absolutely this imperative to just continually define new products, and those products need to be brought to market as quickly as possible. And it's the systems that are helping them to do that, right? Uh, but you know, I guess the the issue is increasingly the connectedness of the systems is an imperative just to ensure the efficiency to bring these products to market as quickly as possible. Uh, otherwise, some of these may end up coming to market uh, sort of falling flat, if you will, because they got one thing wrong, and that was timing. And timing is such an imperative. I think one of the biggest things in this industry when we have to deal with data is the fact that if you are successful and you do go to market and you do launch those products, all of a sudden the data that you collected all along the way to, to get to that point becomes even more valuable because if anything happens in the future, You've got to be able to go back to that. And if you go back and you're asked by a regulatory authority to find data about something happened in an early process, you better be able to find it. So being able to do tagging of that data and being able to search through that data is, is a really important thing that is almost unique to some of the stuff that we do in this industry. So, you know, that's one of the reasons on the earlier webinars we talked a lot about how can I get to that data and find that. Why don't we go on to the next one, Marianne? Now, I would just comment on Ron's, Ron's comment about data going to its final resting place. I'm not sure it ever really goes to its final resting place. So it's really important that you be able to get to it, as Keith mentioned, and also to be able to uh, to to deal with that data and 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 uh, and and get it, uh, and and to be able to uh, my favorite, to be able to convert it into what you need today in case the. Uh, these are long product life cycles. It could be seven, eight, ten years ago that this material was done. It's not the same. It doesn't fit the same way as it did before. So yep. just support on that. And then on the tail end, those regulatory bodies are requesting information be kept for 20 to 25 years. So if you look at it in aggregate, you could have uh, several decades worth of information that you'll need to consider and manage. Right. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. And uh, later on in the in the webinar, I'll talk about a specific um, case that we we worked on um, over the course of time. 
so one of the things, the first thing we're going to talk about is why the need for migration? What's all the things that we have to do? Well, you may hear the concept of a legacy system. What is a legacy system? And in this particular um, picture that you're seeing, uh, for those of you that are computer history nerds, you're going to find out this is the ENIAC. Um, for many, many years ago, I think Marianne suggested that this was out of Philadelphia somewhere. And But our goal is that there's going to be lots of, and if you're in this business for any length of time, you're going to find that every system becomes legacy over time. Whether it's an old version of a, of a piece of software, um, the hardware may go out of, out of um, um, existence. A lot of hardware vendors aren't here anymore. Um, but a system becomes legacy when it's no longer functioning for the requirements of the business and you have to move things off <clears throat> into another system or you have strategic directions that change the way you want to look at things. So our goal is to figure out how do we take the data that's created in some of these systems and be able to use that going forward or going backwards. Um, you can't always keep a legacy system running forever. I can guarantee you that this system that you see here isn't running today and it's not running anything um, computing wise. And you probably have more computing power in your I iPhone um, than what you're looking at in this room right there. Next. So some of the things that we talked about when we're doing when we're dealing with legacy systems is um, do we have to run dual systems? Um, and what does that mean? Running dual systems means that we're going to have an active system going while we're starting up with a new system. Um, a lot of the pitfalls that we have in that regarded um, potentially double data entry, integration challenges between multiple systems, or siloed application and process knowledge. We see this time and time again in numbers of different areas. Um, can you guys talk about any of the other pitfalls that you might think about if we're going to have multiple systems running at the same time? Right. I mean, one thing you're going to ha have is is diff different information coming from different systems. So you always end up with, uh, gee, how come this doesn't reconcile with that? And uh, and and that's, I think, a, a huge issue. And and just getting from uh, and and everything is so integrated today, if not in the systems themselves, but in how you use information that you're constantly moving things back and forth with all the errors that might come over there. So, so it's uh, you know integration has is, is, is become just a huge issue all around. And you know as you move forward, you you know every year I'm sure every year every month sometimes you're putting on new applications and new information. So this is a constant problem that of how do you get the information over. Into, into your new system. So we're rambling a little bit, but this is sort of what we've been doing for 40 years. So. <laughs> so I would say that there are two elements that are primary issues for companies. One relates to effort. Uh, studies will show five to 10 seconds. If people don't know where to put something, can't put that data or that document into a system within five to 10 seconds, you know, they, they won't. So if you have dual systems, and one is easier to work with than the other, then it's very likely that the, you may end up finding people are using that and the data is going, going there, the document's going there when perhaps it could have and should have gone into the other system. But the other element on the back end here is understanding decision making in the organization and the idea of being uh, really confident in decision making that's based on data, data driven decisions that will require you to have that single source of truth of information. So if you've got parallel systems, then invariably you have redundant data, but then the question is how well is that aligned and how well is it cleaned? And if you have data coming through one that's a little dirty, it may ad adversely impact decision-making. So let's, let's talk about some of the advantages of having dual system, are there some? Well, in fact, there are actually some. Um, one of those could be that if you've got a, a part of the company that you want to spin off and you're using certain applications for um, that part of the, the company, it might be easier if you're going to be spinning off part of that. So you keep those on those systems, and those systems might actually go with that company. I've seen that happen numerous times over the, the years I've been in business. And the other one, maybe you might, might want to focus that usage. So you may have a certain set of, of people or a certain product suite that is in one area it's not going to go further than where, where it already is, and you may want to just keep it on that. It's not worth migrating all that data. You've already um, gotten to a point where you're okay with that, everything that's there. I know we have a case in point where we actually hosted for a major pharmaceutical company 
a, a system within our data center was running on an old old deck year and, and uh, they basically needed to go in once a quarter to pull data off of that system and, and um, we had that running for about 10 years within our data center and finally they, uh, they shut it down. Um, they, they had no other way of getting data off of that and they wanted to have that running. So while they had a drug safety system that was the, the production one, this one still ran in parallel because they didn't want to have to migrate any of that into the new system. You know, how about you guys? Other advantages you might think about for, for running I those mean, dual systems? I mean, it's always a cost-benefit analysis, so uh, sometimes you do have these. I think the other place where you, you might actually want separate systems is for security reasons. I mean, where you want to segregate information so it's not reachable to other places. So, I mean, there are legitimate places where you do keep uh, se completely separate environments. Uh, but whether you really want to keep separate, but that doesn't mean it has to be different data structures and different data sets. It, they, they really just need to be segregated. So, but I think that's a legitimate reason where people will uh, will want to keep things separate. The other is what you're saying, Keith. It just it doesn't pay. It doesn't pay. You need this for another five years or ten years, and the cost of moving it over is just going to be higher than just uh, messing. You know, going in once a quarter. That's a, a classically good reason to do, to just keep things the way they are. I would just add on to that uh, a few elements. One is cost. Sometimes you might have one system that is much more cost efficient, for instance, let's say for archiving purposes. So I'm currently working with a company and you know they've they realize they have an aspect of redundancy, but there's a cost benefit in going with one system using it for a specific purpose. I think that, you know purpose built systems, you, when you think about that concept, is another reason for the advantage, meaning within certain departments and functions, uh, they may have a very significant set of work practices that they need to adhere to. They may have work styles that they're accustomed to. And for that reason, they may lean toward having that system stay intact, if you will, and running to some degree parallel. I think, the, I, I have seen this where with mergers and acquisitions, there's a period of time given to that other company, if you will, to sort of continue working with their system. And there's an aspect of the rationalization, harmonization that might take 12 to 24 months. Uh, so those are some advantages, but especially work styles. You know, individuals develop work styles I, ideally, they're aligned with their work practices, their SOPs and work instructions. And if they're going to a new system, then there's a need to develop updated documentation. And so sometimes companies don't want to go there in terms of updating work practices and SOPs. In the case of a merger and an acquisition, that might be a perfect example where the acquiring company may say, hey, let's give the, the, the organization time for it to settle down and let's set a 12 to 24 month time frame for bringing together the systems. And in, the, in that interim process or period, they might not choose to deviate from the processes just to ensure there's continuity in, in the work. And before we're going to move on to the next slide, but before we do that, I just want to say that particularly for fit for purpose applications, things like in the lab or on the manufacturing floor, particularly in this industry, you're gonna see that there's some things that may need to be running uh, while you have other systems in place. So how about let's move on to the next slide. So now when we're talking about enterprise system in integration, there's a bunch of different areas that we wanna look at. What are the things that we look at when we talk about integration? Functionality, the user base, and searching. So let's talk about functionality first. Um, the best does not always win in integration with critical systems. What does that mean? Well, the best does not always win. Let's talk about merger and acquisition. I've been involved in, with a number of these over the years where very large um, pharmaceutical companies buy other very large pharmaceutical companies. Um, some of them may have just invested in, in a new system and they have it out there and it may have far more functionality than another system. However, the user base at the other, at the other company is, is used to the older system or a different system with less functionality, and the cost to migrate or bring everybody onto the new one would be far more than what they want to spend as part of that um, acquisition money. So they would end up staying with the one that has the larger user base. 
So those are one of the things that, that you deal with um, talking with functionality and user base. And then also those critical systems. How do I tie things in to something that could be critical? Is there a time period that we have need to deal with? How do we try to tie those together? Ron, you want to jump on that? Yeah, you know, so you're right. I'm not a spring chicken. Uh, I'm definitely a chicken, though. Um, <laughs> but when I was a spring chicken, uh, one of the first uh, acquisitions that I was involved with was with Pfizer and Warner Lambert. This was a, an $80 billion acquisition. And the day after the acquisition announcement, I was tapped on the shoulder and I was told, you're going to work over the next few years in creating a harmonized, if you will, uh, IT landscape between development and medical affairs. And when we went and we looked at the, the, the systems being utilized by Warner Lambert, it, it was a little bit of a aha moment where people then found themselves thinking, hey, they, they actually are more progressive than we are. Uh, so it can be a very enlightening experience to go through and uh, you know do that sort of very deep analysis of the systems. Um, but, you know, in the case of Pfizer, while they were acquiring, uh, you know, I'd posit to say very few people came from Warner Lambert to the new company. And so that ended up being an issue around the users and their comfort level with the new system. So it's a little bit of a balance, you know, where, yeah, that functionality might look great, but if you don't have users that really understand how to maximize that functionality, then you may sort of dummy it down a little bit. Not that that's the right descriptor, but you know what I, hopefully know what I mean. All right. And uh, I mean, you sometimes do have to dummy it down, that's for sure. It's also, this, uh, this, this, is a, this is a time consuming task to really combine the system. So, uh, and, uh, and so, and it's not done in one day. So, uh, but I think the, the, the 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 danger is that you uh, you sort of leave it and, and never do it. So I mean I've I've come across companies that uh, you know three or four or five years later are still are still siloed in a way which is not helpful to the company. And they and rather than like taking them uh, uh, putting together a plan where uh, over time you you uh, you you put together the systems is also sort of gets left. Uh, Left aside, and I think siloing the systems has a big cost to it. So I, th I think one of the things that's important is to be part of the plan to be able to uh, to know to to know how you're going to do this and make sure that you you don't leave things on on the wayside. Um, if I could just pick up on that last note there, Mark, in terms of siloed systems, one place that you will know you have siloed systems in your company is when it comes to search without a doubt and uh, you know th this will end up being I think an aspect that companies increasingly will want that enterprise related search mechanism and at a minimum you, you have to have your systems integrated but you know ideally you're doing this rationalization you break the walls down in the silos but through the search engine capacity yeah, that's a great topic, Ron. And one of the things I want to bring up was that in both webinars two and three of our series, we talked a lot about metadata taxonomies, <clears throat> and we talked about um, content structure and systems integration. So if you go back and look at those webinars, you'll be able to see a lot more of the detail aspect of that. But the concept of finding data and where that's going in the future, you know, one of the things that we're all working on are things now, and I know that DCL is, is uh, this is one of the major areas that DCL deals with, is getting that data in a place where when it goes from one system to another, we can make sure that we can find that data and we link it. One of the biggest issues is gonna be structured versus unstructured data and how we get to that data. There's a lot of new systems and we're seeing a lot of push into machine learning and AI to help us be able to find some of that data across all these different systems. So I think that's gonna be a major push in the future for how we can tie some of those together. Absolutely right, and also making sure your uh, the proverbial apples and apples that you compare apples and apples data changes how you use it changes. So I think there's uh, there's uh, there's a need to make sure that the data you're looking at and information you're looking at really matches together. And uh, and you know it's it's like pharma companies are more and more data enterprises today, just totally dependent on the information they've collected, both uh, both the the, the 
the, 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 the data itself and all the textual materials and written materials and everything else. So it's, I think it's, it's really, and, and the length of time is there, it's getting more and more important that you be able to be able to use it all, otherwise you're at a disadvantage. There's a high cost to that. Go ahead, Mary, and the next one. <laughs> so some of the reasons that we have migration events, we talk a lot about the data and the need to migrate data, <coughs> excuse me, are a number of different things could happen. Merger and acquisition was one of them. We talked about maybe the company has a cloud first strategy and we want to go to applications in the cloud. Maybe there's a new system. Um, the system we had, the company went out of business or we need to get a new, new software vendor that comes in. Or there's new technology. Something brand new comes out and we're just going to shift everything over to that. Each one of these, and there are many other, but they force us to think about migration. And those are some of the events we deal, we deal with. Some of the thoughts that we had as we were putting these slides together, we're talking about, you know, not all content needs to be migrated. What does that mean? Uh, identity of cradle to grave content. And let's, we'll talk about that as part of this, this discussion. And then chain of custody may need to be considered. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about what that means too. Why don't we kick it off and just talk about not all content, content needs to be migrated. What does that really mean? Mark, you want to want to handle that one, or, or Ron? Well, well, I think I think we, we've sort of touched on it all. It's really a, a some data will will never be needed again. So uh, you know, I, I I never throw anything away. I'm one of those people, so I, you know, I find it hard <laughs> to do. But some data will, will not be needed again, and and some data will is is truly archival. Will never be. You you won't need to pull out uh, uh, things from for any future analysis. Uh, so th so th it's important to get those things out of, out of the picture because there is a core there is a cost certainly to everything. But I think all the all the you know live information that people are using that uh, people are using this can go back five, ten, fifteen, twenty, and as Ron said, could go you know regulatory requirements may go even further back. Uh, is is uh, information that that uh, either should be migrated or maintained in a in a form that it could be migrated at a later time if need be. So. Yeah, and I guess one aspect of this presentation is focusing, if you will, on content. And then, you know, what is content? Uh, you know, that is both data and that is documents. Uh, when it comes to documents, you know, you can absolutely see where, you know, with technology that's evolved over the years, increasingly you can do versioning of a document within sort of that singular document. The way it works, as we know, in, in years prior was people would create the versions and versions and versions. And so there is an aspect of trying to understand where the, the, the live wood is versus the dead wood. And, um, you know, that's in it a very detailed and labor intensive process, to be honest with you, that one needs to go through. With that said, there are tools that uh, both DCL and Court Square Group use for effectively looking at documents, comparing and contrasting them, trying to see which are different um, or which are completely redundant, um, and then to try to then understand which are underlying versions and sort of the understanding the parent and child data, parent child documents, that's really an imperative. Uh, but you know, going back to Mark's point, and when it comes to archiving data, you know, sometimes you say, you know what, let's not move this off the file server but let's encapsulate it. And so that no one can go in heretofore and alter it so that if need be, we can show it to a regulatory body. Um, but uh, you know, versioning is one aspect and the encapsulation are some other aspects that I would say factor into the equation. How about on the identification of cradle to grave content? And what does that mean? You know, in my view, when I talk about cradle to grave content, we talk about that fact that I started with a system and when I end with that data, so if I have a drug product and we need to make sure we're lock, looking at over a 20 year period, can I make sure that the first systems that we put that data into were somehow migrated over the life of that content so that we can actually get back to that early systems? Or do we have some kind of event in the middle there that we have to deal with and make sure that we can at least find that data um, at the end? So those are areas that, that we've had to deal with um, in numerous occasions. So I think you have to worry about that particularly when you're defining metadata, defining taxonomies, 
how do I find that data? How do I make sure that it's transferred correctly into a, any new systems that we're dealing with? In a few areas where this comes into being, or for instance, with the TMF, you know, that aspect of really understanding the life cycle of that document uh, and how it was being utilized to basically make decisions and, and enable a clinical trial to be executed, uh, you need to show that life cycle, if you will. Uh, and for instance, when it comes to a, a protocol and all of those addendums that might happen, and not just in one country, but across the globe. And you can see like suddenly it can get very, very complex if you had multiple addendums across uh, dozens of countries, which often happens in areas, but especially oncology, if you are looking at an oncologic agent and you have one chemo backbone used in one country versus another. Another area is around batch records, right? You need to be able to show that uh, th that life cycle, if you will, of the batch records over time. And uh, you know, th that's those are just two areas where it becomes much more pronounced uh, in terms of that need. Right. One of the last topics I talked about was the chain of custody and the concept of chain of custody. And to some people, that means different things to different people. I've recently been involved with a number of cell therapy companies and dealing with autologous cells and dealing with patient, you know, needle to needle, they call it. So basically from the patient back into the patient, you're doing something with their cells. So the concept of making sure that the data that identifies what you're working on, you have a very clear chain of custody all the way through it. And you see new techniques and new technologies being added, things like blockchain, which are being used pretty heavily in Bitcoin and the whole financial world, is now hitting our world where those things are helping to kind of track and trace all of that, um, those uh, products all along the way. And I know track and trace in our industry has been huge, particularly for counterfeit drugs and different things that we have to deal with. Uh, comments, yeah. guys? Well, it makes me realize that we perhaps should have added a, a – uh, a bubble around regulatory changes. In fact, regulatory changes could dictate whether you need to migrate or not. And for instance, IDMP, which I think we may have talked about in either the first or second webinar series, IDMP, that identification of medicinal, medicinal product, is de definitely something that helps a a company and regulatory bodies understand the integrity of that uh, chain, if you will, uh, but including as it relates to uh, the component parts of a pharmaceutical. Um, so, yeah, I would say that we should add that to this, um, perhaps maybe before we post it. Uh, I guess that's not possible because the video will be posted to the, to the webinar. <laughs> Anyway, we, we can always add an addendum on that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, the whole area of counterfeit drugs and making sure that you've got what you think you have is, is, a, is just a problem. It's certainly not an area of my expertise, but I, I keep on coming across it in my in my readings. And it's 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 an issue not just in drugs. It's an issue with all kinds of products. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's a whole new dimension that needs to be added over here. So we talked a little bit earlier about the whole concept of system integration and being able to search and find data. The concept of mapping that legacy data um, and metadata de definition. Uh, a lot of times these are triggered by M&A events. So you may have some vendors come in that help to kind of pull things together. They may define, they may look at mapping all of your data across multiple systems. I know Ron and I have been brought in on a number of different occasions to help do some of that and the reliance on outside vendors to drive conventions. Sometimes internal politics within some of these large organizations cause some kind of strife between different, different organizations. So sometimes it's just easier to have an outside vendor come in and help you kind of lay that out and say, okay, here's how we should go. This is the most cost-effective way to go forward and kind of to drive that. Um, yeah. There may be some reconciliation event that forces a change for those as well. Ron, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I, I'm sorry to cut you off there, Keith, but yeah, that aspect of the prickly pear is something that for sure needs to be considered when it comes to assessing systems for rationalization. Because going back to that aspect of users having a preference, a work style, there's going to be sensitivity in the organization. And you know, you may very quickly hit a nerve in discussing the rationalization of someone else's system or another department's system. And yeah, I would agree with you, Keith, that it, it is 
very helpful to have a, a seemingly neutral party there to help facilitate a conversation and really get the group focused more on the pros and cons and the features and benefits of the different solutions and um, you know guide the discussion and at the end of the day if you are rationalizing and you are putting a system to bed some people may not be happy with that and the way to ensure that it's a win-win-win situation is to go through a process and really make it abundantly clear to one and all that hey you know you're doing what's best for the company you're thinking short and midterm and perhaps even long -term. you we need the pros and cons you've looked at the features and benefits and you make a collective decision now you know not everyone will ultimately agree with the decision but the idea in an organization is once you make that decision ideally through consensus then everyone should stand behind it but uh, yeah, again, having an outside party to help broker, I think, could be very, very helpful. Yeah, I would, I would, I would uh, just uh, your your uh, your phrasing of seemingly neutral. I think a person does have to be neutral, and and has to be, you know, has to be clearly neutral. But uh, I, I, you know, just as a, as a as a sound on the side, the real difficult issues on these are the people issues, the mechanics of it, and the metadata and the mapping. Those we can solve, and our experts can solve all those things. But the people issues that you're bringing up are really the, the tough ones. And if somebody out there is going to not accept the decisions, uh, it's very easy to sabotage a process uh, without anybody even realizing. So it's really very important to get by, and and, and it's not an easy thing to do. But it's, it's no, and it and I just want to just go back to that aspect of the seemingly neutral <laughs> element because. You know, at the end of the day, if a vendor is brought in to support, right, the question is, who brought that vendor in? And do they have a, a, an allegiance, if you will, to the person that hired them? Uh, but yeah, by all means, Mark, I agree with you. There, there has to be that neutrality. You need to be seen as sort of the Switzerland of decision making. And, uh, you know, I think all three of us would say that we're not, we're very system agnostic. You know, we're here to help companies understand how to structure their data better, how to integrate in a more seamless fashion, how to increase the efficiency. It's not about us. It's about ensuring you, you, your business objectives are met. Right. And, and you know, I also think there's. A, so I also think there's a way um, when you think about. You know, we talk about mapping legacy data, and you think people think about legacy. It's it's got to be an old company with old systems. <clears throat> the reality is it could also be a state change in the company where you go from an R&D company into one that's now going to have a full product out there or we're now, we just, now just got funding and now we're going to hit a regulatory um, issue that we're going to have to deal with. <clears throat> so that concept of reconciliation event could be one of those things where I'm now going from R&D, I now have to go into more, more kind of uh, cohesive systems and kind of tie those together. So you can take that opportunity to take local file shares or things in box or dropbox or ignite or different areas and kind of pull them together i know that we deal with that on a very regular basis when we're using that as a as a kind of a forcing function to help companies look across the spectrum of all their data and say okay how do you really want to have that because right now one of the big issues that we hear of i can't find anything or it's always over here or i can't map that drive or i can't do this so we use that as a reconciliation event to help companies identify well how do you want to find it what do you want to do What's the way that would best suits the way you guys want to move forward? And then we use that as a way to say, here's how we're going to map it. Here's how we're going to tie it out. And here's what you're going to be able to see going forward. And that's usually a way that, that people can look at it. I mean, think of in practical terms, you've just moved into a new house and you've got boxes and boxes of stuff. And it's kind of overwhelming that you've moved all this stuff out. Some people hire a, a third party person to come in to help them just to organize. So you have these organizers. We're organizers for the closets. Your data closet is what we're going to organize, and that's kind of what you think about there. Um, yeah. Other comments, so, guys? Where do you move on? No, so yeah. your analogy, okay, I think, points something very important. So one thing people do when they move is they just take all those boxes and put it in the attic and never really look at them properly, and then it disappears anyway. And really, this the, the movement of data like this is a time when it's really important to not just move things over, but to make sure that you can find it at, at, at least at some level. So it's not just moving the boxes, but the contents of the boxes need to be, yeah. <laughs> need to be organized. 
and I think it's fair to say we we go into the attic. We also go down into the basement, right? And the, you know, we we need to understand in totality where the data is, and then just to help rationalize it. Anyway, so how do we do it? How do we kind of rationalize? How do we bring these things together? How do we map? So we talk a lot about multiple production systems. Um, you may end up having to have multiple production systems that that feed into each other. You may end up putting a clearinghouse system between those systems because you don't want to break that, or you may have invested heavily into something. We might have different departments using different platforms. If that's the case and you, you keep them separated, you may, you may need to do some of that. Or we might have customized processes that we've developed to deal with different silos of data and how they do that. There might be some practical reasons for doing what you do and maybe merging that data or migrating that or centralizing it. You know, a lot of times you're going to see this shift from centralized to decentralized and then from decentralized back to centralized. Our industry is not not any different than any other industry, and you see this across the board. Every 10 years or so, some new thing comes out, and we're going to be doing this this pull toward the center, and then then breaking it back out again. And you know, I think every time you have a different set of executives come into a corporation, they've got to kind of show their way and do that. So um, we do that through lots of different things with the system. Comments, guys. No, I think you're absolutely right. I don't have anything to add to that. Um... What I would add is just around policies and procedures. So, yeah, with this uh, expansion of some of the platforms that are out there, it's making companies look at their policies and procedures very differently, meaning today it's much easier to think about enterprise content management and uh, using some of the platforms. And I'll just throw one out there. I think it's called Microsoft. Right, uh, you know, within Office 365, you've got basically dozens of apps, and many of these are associated with their ability to manage content. And so, it is easier now for a company to look at their policies and think about retention, retention records, retention of records in particular. Right, and uh, there, there's also the aspect of you know, how people are managing information, uh, which historically in life sciences happens quite a bit in email. And you know, people historically have felt like, well, you know, I've got my folders and I can keep these at infinitum, but many companies are now rethinking the aspect of the retention of not only records, but records and uh, in w within email. And so they can institute policies and they are, uh, using platforms like Microsoft to say, you know, your email is transitory. You know, you've got basically 180 or 365 days in which to manage it. Uh, but thereafter, that stuff needs to either be put in a sort of an archive folder, if you will, within Outlook or within that resident system. And uh, it's something that companies will do to mitigate risk, right? Their exposure. Uh, and, um, you know, there's that addiction that we have to Outlook in particular, right, email for managing information, and it's not really an enterprise content management solution. I mean, it's a point solution that was designed 30 plus years ago to share information, um, but it's not enterprise content management. Um, but, you know, I would posit to say, you know, Office 365 more holistically is, and then the question is, if you go there, then, you know, it's not for the faint of heart, policies and procedures need to change in the company and it needs to be driven from the top down too. Sounds good. And Marianne, how about let's move on to for the because I know what we're getting short on time here. Yeah, so you know they Ron, say you wanna... you're, you're going, I think it was Yogi Berra who said it, you'll end up someplace else. Um, you know, and you, you're not necessarily being given signs when it comes to this rationalization work, but what you have are steps that you can consider following. And you know, the thing is to go into it sort of open-minded and really think, okay, anything and everything is up for grabs, meaning even that system we just implemented a few months ago might be worth reconsidering. So you need to think about what are your objectives in your defining a, a strategy, if you will, for your, your data and your, your content. And you need to think about the drivers and technological change of underlying platforms is what we're talking about here. You may also have imperatives within your business. You may have 
uh, kappas that you're dealing with, and you need to put in a better quality management system, as an example. Um, you may have you know, some one of, things, Ron, I, yeah. one of the things I want to add to what you were saying is when I was thinking about um, on the slide earlier and now and for this one, it's one thing to be a sponsor and have lots of data and lots of systems, but if you're also a consultant or a CRO working with lots of sponsors, you may actually have to deal with lots of different systems across those sponsors. So being able to figure out how your systems can work with their systems is as big a part of some of this stuff to do. So when you're visualizing yeah. that roadmap, how am I visualizing how I'm working with lots of different customers or lots of different sponsors across the continuum as well? Yeah. Yeah, so the uh, the identification of where the systems are going, that's a that's a requisite. And um, in on this slide here now, it was sort of shifting what we're looking at. It's basically, it's a very simplistic roadmap for a uh, an organization and it goes over multiple quarters and it's broken out in this case by aspects of infrastructure needed improvements aspects of integration this is ver a very simple rendering that anyone can very quickly absorb and sort of get a sense of where they need to go uh, over a period of time but the fact is you can make it much more complex you could break it out by functional areas in the company you can show the interconnections between these systems. You can show the connection with documents as well. But having a map is something that will enable you to have a discussion with a group and uh, sort of get everyone, if you will, on the same page. So there are outfits that offer templates. In this case, this one is from RoadMonk, just as an example. Next slide. Thanks, Maria. So, you know, when it comes to that sort of uh, separation between data and documentation, this, this is a little bit more focused, if you will, on the documentation side, the idea of enterprise content management. And I just labeled this the roadmap to Nirvana, but you can see this was developed by AIM International. So they're being uh, given credit. Um, and uh, it was uh, a rendering that basically shows the value of an enterprise content management system from capturing the information, storing it, ultimately preserving it, and then delivering it, um, but delivering it across a multitude of channels, as you can see in the bottom right uh, quadrant of the of the graphic. But uh, you know, having a sort of a sense of where you want to go with these platforms is important, and having a visualization uh, means like this is, uh, it's invaluable because a lot of people when they hear enterprise content management, they don't really think of all the component parts, but as you can see here, we've got about three dozen different component parts. Hey, Eleanor, on this picture brings up something that uh, this, this area in the middle where it talks about store, it brings up a number of things that I've had to deal with over the course of the years and that when people are taking data or they're archiving data, a lot of times they cut it to a CD or they put it on tape or they do something like that. I've had numerous occasions where people have put it onto media that they no longer have the, the equipment that can actually read that media anymore. So as, long, as well as you're looking at your data, you have to look at how I'm storing that data and do I have a, uh, a process or any kind of defined methodology of making sure that that archive data stays current with the technology that we have in-house. So those are other things that, that we as consultants to the industry have to think about for our client base, but sometimes they don't. A lot of times you may have a business unit that says, hey, I'm turning this over to IT, so now it's IT's problem. And for them, they don't really think about some of that until somebody asks for it. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about that lifetime and having something for 20 years. Well, that, that one time you get a request from a regulatory authority to look at something, you know, years back, and they, you, can't, you can't get that off that tape. Now you're, now you're scrambling to try to find somebody who can deal with that. So those are just a, a quick comment I wanted to make sure I brought up as part of this. And right. you know, when it, uh, also, next, it's not just that you can't read it, but maybe that nobody can read it at this point. I mean, it, the technology, storage technology has shifted so quickly over the last 30, 40 years that the, this, there's a technology that's only 20 years old that really is very, very hard to find uh, uh, somebody yeah. who can read it. So uh, it's a very good point you're bringing, Keith. Yeah, we didn't Thanks, even go to the uh, element uh, where you know, some acquisitions, you get a room of documents and they're in boxes that you need to manage. I just talked with a customer just last week, a potential customer last week, 
that talked about a phase one, phase two clinical trial <clears throat> that they had that they had done. They just got purchased and now they're with another company and they want to be able to take that, that old data and be able to do something with it. It's not in digital form. So how can they find anything? So we're talking about how do we digitize that, put it into a form and then put it into an ETMF or something that they can actually search. So that's a real life example of what happens out there. This slide is, is a slide from one of our earlier webinars, talks specifically about that metadata mapping, the identification of fields, determining the overlap, and then looking at the numbering schemes and how we can tie that together. Again, it's all about the data. It may have nothing to do with the system they came from. It may be the data that comes out of the systems, and how do we keep that going to a point where we can keep shifting that along to different systems along the continuum. Next, Marianne. You know, one of the big things that I think that we all think, you know, we have to think about, particularly in this industry, is the audit trails and the governance of that data over time and where it goes. Even though we shift from one system to another to another, what happens with the audit trails from the legacy system? Are we making sure that we're taking uh, into account the fact that we have to see how somebody changed something in that last system? Are we taking an export of the audit trail so we have them as part of the artifacts going forward? When you start with a new system and it's a fresh system, we may start fresh from this one system and go forward for anything new, but we have to keep that legacy data and somehow be able to get back to it and look that down. And if that's the case, are we locking it down and we're not migrating that stuff? Are we keeping that in a place where we can still get at it for those audit purposes when somebody's coming back to you, particularly from a regulatory body or a partner? Many of us have our small farm or biotechs and we have a large partner. They may wanna be able to look at that data or be able to do something with that data. So we may make sure we have to maintain access for audit purposes and make sure they are still searchable and you're able to get to them. And that governance plan says, you gotta have somebody, whether it's a data archivist or, or somebody that knows how to get to that, they have access to that, and maybe you go to a central authority within your company that they can actually find some of those things for you. Those are some of the things that you, that you have to think about when you're putting these together. Mark, I know that a lot of your systems are specifically built to do some of that for these companies right. so they well, can get back to some of those systems. Right, specifically built to that, but also it do, it's something that definitely comes up uh, fairly frequently where uh, a customer has, has information that's been collected over a number of, of years and, and, and there's a need to go back and, and get an audit trail on where it is. So it's really important that every time you move data, every time you change data, you've retained information about what happened at that point. So, uh, yeah, I think we've talked about this a little bit so now, but that's really uh, audit and going back to it is something that really does come up uh, fairly frequently, certainly with pharma data, certainly with legal data. It's all, uh, it's, it's all very important. And, and you can't rely on emails to be able to find your, your audit. That's not the way it works. Yeah, I mean, it's a, lot, a, lot, a lot of times you end, you end up with, before you've taken on the control of it, is uh, that, that becomes a very manual process. So uh, you certainly want to avoid that in any new systems that you're doing. Marianne, how about popping to the next one? There's a couple key points I think we wanted to make down that we had talked about ourselves. Can we export the data in a format that is retrievable? If the system isn't going to be around and we're not going to have that system, can the data be exported to something that we can either read or search or be able to do something with it? That's one of the big things about maybe an XML backbone or something like that, that you put it into right. a place that we can actually get to that data. Right. And, and a lot of times you think of a, a PDF file as something you're going to produce or, or, some, or, or just an image file and realize that those are not processable in the wrong way. So, uh, if you move it into XML, you can actually use that information later on in ways that you didn't realize at the time to put it away. If you put it into a PDF file, that's really a print format in a way, and and uh, taking it apart later on becomes uh, a, a much more uh, much more difficult task. Um, second thing was was do we need to keep an application going to access the data? If we can't export it to a format that there. Can we keep that? Like I said earlier about that thing with one of our major pharma clients, we had a system going for 10 years for no no other reason than they couldn't have it in, a, in any other system, so we kept that around. Um, and it was it, it was just easier for them to be able to do that. Um, right. What are some of the best practices with data retention policies? Each of you guys have to deal with data retention policies on a very regular basis. How about some some couple words of wisdom on that on that? 
I'll leave that for you. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, data retention is whatever the legal requirements are usually. So we do need to make sure of that and make sure they're there. But I don't know, Ron, if you have specific things that you're, you've been working with. Well, you know, realizing we're running short on time, I would just say it's a good policy to have a data retention policy. <laughs> Very good point. And then locking down the data and making sure that there's only access to certain people that can get to it, because you still want to maintain that governance that you had initially with that document. So don't don't put it in a place where it's open to anybody, making sure you're locking it down and, and that, that data can't change. Those are going to be important things to think about. Next, Marianne, you can pop over to the next one and then run after that. We'll start getting into the use cases. Okay, okay, so just very quickly on uh, use cases. I, I mean, the place where we have a lot of experiences on, and there's a lot of our places where data is being used in, in the pharma industry, but certainly uh, in structured product labeling, we support close to, I think, 200 companies now where we're getting the information in. So uh, this, is, this is one way in which information needs to be moved into XML because it's gonna be used is required by, by regulation if in the United States now, soon in Canada, soon in other parts, parts of the world. So that's an area that we've been working with. There's other areas similar to that where information is going to be kept in a very structured way. So uh, that's, that's really uh, a lot of what we do is make sure information is structured in a way so that can, we can do all the things we've talked about at, at the beginning of this hour. And I'll, I'll move this on to uh, the next case that I, I think Keith are on. Great. And over the course of the whole webinar series. So thank you. Thank you for that, Mark. Next. So from a use case, from a court square perspective, we can talk about um, we were working with a major um, medical device manufacturer who was spinning off a, um, a pharmaceutical division. Their IT department didn't have time. They, they had a year's worth of backlog, and these guys wanted to be able to do a drug submission within a year. The problem was, they didn't have the capability resources internally to do it. We helped out by being able to take that data, not only getting them up and running with multiple applications in, a, in an audit ready compliant fashion, but also being able to integrate those, train people on them, and do their submissions ahead of time in a very reasonable fashion, time dependent, um, got them going. And after two and a half years, we actually were able to pull that back into their IT department. We helped them put together the entire metadata setup and migrate stuff back into legacy systems or other systems that the, that the company had. Let's go on to the next, Ron. Yeah, and with General Life Sciences, I wanted to just highlight a, a case study that's associated with enterprise content strategy and, and information architecting. Uh, basically, uh, and it's a more recent example, working with a mid-sized company grew, grew in a very accelerated fashion over just a few years uh, uh, to where uh, you know they, they are looking at their systems and they're thinking, well, now we need to, this rationalization. But especially from an enterprise content management perspective, i.e., documents. Uh, so we're uh, tasked to drive the program management. As a company, we offer project management services in a fractionated or full-time manner. Um, and then at the same time, we're also tasked with helping them to audit their content. And you know, we're talking the attic, you know, the house, and the basement, uh, and really trying to put together a cohesive picture for them, but especially with their clinical data uh, for uh, literally a decade. Uh, basically, right. Thank pardon? Thanks, Ron. We're gonna have to finish up. We're getting to, uh, close on time here. I understand. And so let's, let's kind of put this up as a kind of a closing slide for the webinar. I just want to show everybody that um, the three of us, three different companies, DCL, CourtSquare, and JANA, we're in this together, kind of helping you based on what we've done, our expertise across the board, whether it's data and content structure, hosting and applications, and program and process management. All, all of those factors are needed when you're dealing with some of these um, small or large um, prob problems. We're here to help you guys. Last one, Marianne, just a thanks to everybody that was on. Um, Mark and Ron, everybody, thank you guys. All right, thank you, Keith, for running this show today. And Ron, I think it's been great. Uh, it's a great program. Yeah, um, I definitely enjoyed and, it. And thank you, everyone, who's taken time out of their day. Okay, Marianne, sorry. Sure, thank you, everyone, for taking time out of their day to um, join us. Um, this concludes today's program. Um, I just want to remind everyone that the DCL Learning Series comprises similar webinars to this. 
Um, we also have a monthly newsletter and a blog. Um, you can access many other webinars related to content structure and XML from dataconversionlaboratory.com. This concludes today's program. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.